I probably ought to record this. Um, Sorry, I turned on record in case somebody doesn't get to this and wants to see it. And so that's that's what that's what we're evaluating. And so I'll just finish over here. P1 minus P2 is equal to one half rho times uh, P2 squared minus V1 squared, just to simplify. And that's equal to one half times 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter times 42 meters per second. Uh, squared minus 40 meters per second squared, right? I just distributed the one half row to the outside and I get 105 for that. And the units for that are, it should be in, in kilograms. Um, those are meters squared. You want to be really careful about the units. So the pressure difference is 105 pascals. It's P1 minus P2. And so P1 is larger than P2 by 105 pascals. Okay. I'm almost with it here. All right.
Okay, maybe 30 seconds. So this answer this question, most of you got it right. In fact, I think everybody who answered it got it right. It wasn't very many, but. Um, but the force is just the pressure times the area. And so that's uh, uh, 105 pascals times uh, 40 meters squared, right? And if you want to just, I always like to have the units in, in, with a name that I, that I can relate to. And so I would write that 105 pascals instead of 105 newtons per meter squared times 40 meters squared, which gives me, is that 4,200 newtons? I made these numbers up, but it's not, I mean, 4,200 Newtons is about a thousand pounds. That's not, a lot, not enough to lift most airplanes. And probably that speed difference over the top and bottom of the wing is smaller than that. But you can clearly see you get even for small pressure differences. That's a pretty small pressure difference. You multiply that by a, a large area for wings. Wings typically have large areas. You get a, um, you get a lot of lift out. And so it can matter. Of course, we put such enormous engines on planes now and fill them full of fuel. Um, they don't really need this. But like I was saying last time, if you're flying a crop duster or something like that and your engine goes bad, it's nice to know you're getting some lift from these guys to, uh, to uh, survive something. Fly, fly a little farther to find that runway. So if you if you think about Bernoulli's principle just a little bit for for like uh, um, for other reasons, I think I may have, I can't remember if I talked about this in the video or not. But if, if this is like a if this is like a coronary artery or any artery, I don't know where my screen is right now. Yeah, it's close. Enough. And you ate a lot of cheeseburgers. I'm not picking on cheeseburgers. Um, you get this, this atherosclerosis here, right? You get, um, you get uh, plaque. I don't know how you spell that. Is it, is it P-L-A-C-Q-U-E or something like that, right? Um, build up in your arteries, right? People get these in their coronary arteries. And, and, and so, you know, this is the speed of the fluid, right? And this is V1, and this is V2. And so we know that from our flow rate that we talked about last time, right? The flow rate is constant. If the area is thinner, this is A2, and this is A1 out here where the artery is, is less damaged, one. We know that uh, A2, A1 is greater than A2. So V2 is greater than V1 because uh, the flow rate is constant. Therefore, uh, therefore the pressure here by Bernoulli's principle, Right, the flow rate forces V2 to be faster than V1, right? It forces that. These, by the way, are all at the same height, say, so the heights don't matter. And so if V2 is greater than V1, then P1 is greater than P2, or to say it differently, uh, P2 is less than P1. Well, your arteries are, are, are kept open. They're not, they're not rigid like PVC pipe. 
they're biological and so they're squishable and they keep themselves open by having pressure inside. And so as, as, the, as this vein narrows, as this artery narrows, the, uh, the pressure inside steadily decreases. And if the pressure here is greater than P2, eventually it could just shut off that vein, that artery, right? And this is what happens to, uh, to people who eat bad diets. I think a lot of it's related to just your genetics. But, uh, but anyway, this is why uh, uh, these uh, plaque buildup in your arteries is so dangerous because the effect it has is, is, uh, is just some really pretty simple physics. Um, forces the velocity to increase, forces the pressure to decrease, eventually shuts off the flow because the pressure can't keep the vein open anymore. All right. Um, let me pull out another. Uh... So this is another, my hint on this one is this is another Bernoulli problem. I think I did an example like this. In the video. There we go. Wait a minute, I just messed up, sorry. Okay.
All right. I'll give you 10 more seconds. This is kind of a bad question, but. a little ahead of myself. I was asking for the gauge pressure. I should have just been asking for the pressure, right? Um, the, the, the pressure in the, in, in, the, uh, in the thin stream of water just outside the dam is just, uh, technically the gauge pressure should be zero if it's relative to atmospheric pressure. It almost doesn't matter because I, since I didn't say if it was relative to inside of the dam or anything. Um, and so that's just the pressure uh, 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 for the stream of water. This is P in the stream of water here, right? We're going to be thinking about the, what we're going to, ultimately we're going to be trying to figure out what the speed is of the stream of water, right? And so we're kind of filling out the Bernoulli, Bernoulli principle. And so, uh, um, so we know that the pressure in the stream just outside the dam as, as it's leaving is just uh, 10 to the fifth, uh, sorry, 10 to the 5th Pascals each is one atmosphere. Okay. And so kind of what I want you to do in this problem is use the Bernoulli principle here. And, uh, and so you can call this like, uh, you, can, you can call this point two, say, and, and the question is, what is point one? And I'm going to tell you, just pick point one at the top of the water. So for the water, um, this, is, this is point one. And see if, you can, see if you can fill this out and figure out what the, uh, what the speed is. And this one, the H's matter, right?
All right, maybe another 30 seconds. So I sort of think these uh, these Bernoulli problems are a little bit about finding out uh, uh, picking your points, right? So if we pick uh, if we pick these two points as one and two, and we write the Bernoulli principle P one plus one half rho P one squared plus rho g H one equals P two plus one half rho P two squared plus rho g H2, I'm going to sell my screen. I think I drew that right. Barely. Um, and I can say, if this is my, my one position, I can say, look, the velocity at one is zero. Because I, I'm assuming this hole is small and the, the, the fluid isn't sinking fast or something and have some downward velocity there, right? And I can also make the argument that, uh, well, so, so now how do I define the H's for these? Well, it, H is just sort of like the potential energy term. And so I can say H1 equals zero, and sorry, H2 equals zero, and H1 equals 10 meters. But just like with potential energy, I can call them anything, as you'll see in a second, right? Notice that the, the P's here are both atmospheric at the top of the water. P1 equals atmospheric pressure is 10 to the fifth pascals. And the same thing with P2. P2 is, is atmospheric pressure because they're both outside the dam. And so they're just out in the air. And so I could, since these two are equal, I can just cancel them, subtract them from both sides, subtract 10 to the fifth pascals, and I get my equal signs on both sides. And now what I have is just this term, this term, and this term. And so I get one half rho v2 squared equals rho g h1 minus rho g h2. That is, I subtracted this guy over the other side. And this gives me one half rho v2 squared is equal to rho g times h1 minus h2. And just like I said, it didn't matter if this was 10 meters and this was zero, or this was 37 meters and this is 27 meters, because it just depends on the difference of them. The rows cancel. And so I get v, V2 is equal to the square root of uh, 2g times h1 minus h2 is uh, square root of 2 times 10 meters per second squared times 10 meters. It's about 14 meters per second. That should look, this formula should look a little bit familiar from last semester or your first semester physics class with kinematics. That's the speed that you would have if you dropped something and it fell 10 meters, which is basically what's happening here. I realize that this water isn't the water that leaves the hole, but that's the idea. The pressure acts so that this water here has enough force on it to push it out at the speed as though it had fallen from that distance. I think that's the end of fluids. That's all I have to say about fluids. And so I've got a few minutes left, and so we'll do some of the uh, um, uh, temperature and heat questions. And hopefully, these, at least the first few will be pretty easy for you.
30 more seconds. All right. Roughly, right? And so if I have two temperatures, I do wrong here. Plus, sorry, minus 273. I'm almost there. Right. This is the same thing as T2 Kelvin. And this is the same thing as T1 Kelvin. And so these two are equal. If I transmit the minus sign through, these guys go away, and I get T2 Celsius minus T1 Celsius. Right. And so a difference in Kelvin is the same thing as the difference in Celsius. The scales are shifted. But each degree means the same thing. This shows up a lot because we get equations like the MCAT equation, right? Which we saw in lab equals MC delta T. It turns out if you don't, it doesn't matter if you put that temperature change in Celsius or Kelvin, temperature changes are insensitive to that because that what matters for those, for a temperature change is just the difference between the two. And, uh, and that, that comes out the same. Right. The scale, the value of each degree is the same. So temperature differences um, are the same. This is also a little tricky, I would say. Another minute.
right. This is a very similar question, right? So, so the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is nine fifths temperature in Celsius uh, plus 32. So if I stick in zero for the Celsius temperature, this one comes out to 32. Or if I stick in 180, so for TC equals zero, T Fahrenheit is 32. T Celsius equals 100, T Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths times 100 plus 32, which is 9 fifths times 100 is 180 plus 32 is 212, right? And so that's how they're related. Um, and, and, and that's consistent with the freezing points and the boiling points, right? And so I can do the same thing I did just a second ago. I can say, look, T1 Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths times T1 Celsius plus 32. And T2 Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths times T2 Celsius plus 32. And so T2 Fahrenheit minus T1 Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths T2 Celsius plus 32 minus 9 fifths. Let's see if I can do it right this time. T1 Celsius plus 32. Right. And just like last time, these two guys cancel because that minus sign transmits through, and I could just get 9 fifths times T2 Celsius minus T1 Celsius, which is which is 1.8 times uh, times in our case, a temperature change of 10 degrees Celsius, which is 10 degrees Celsius, is just 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this is the relative size of one degree, nine fifths. One Celsius, one degree Celsius is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And so temperature change is just look at the temperature change in Celsius multiplied by 1.8. And that gives you the temperature change in Fahrenheit. The absolute temperatures are also shifted by this amount. But when you look at a temperature difference, those cancel, just like with the Kelvin. Well, that's probably a good stopping point. So um, we will, hopefully we'll be in class on Monday. And um, we'll talk about a test. That we'll do a test after the next chapter. So it won't be next week. It, at the earliest to be late the week after next week. And so. Um, and probably maybe like two weeks from Monday, but I, I would say it would be a good test day. All right, that's all I got. You can hang around and ask me questions if you want to. Otherwise, uh, we're done. Uh, I hope the screen isn't still blurry. Was the screen blurry the whole time? No, not the whole time. It just got out of focus for a second, but then oh. it came back. I appreciate you telling me that. You got to yell at me next time. Because okay. in one of my classes, it was stuck that way for like 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Trail. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a great day.